always here at the center. Oh, okay, right next to him. And now he goes there for after school. Okay. And I'm on the board. So our lives are pretty, like, pretty centered around that place. That's great. But they have a pretty hard stop at 6 o'clock. Right, 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 right. I was thinking, I just want my husband. I get it, but Phil. So you work with Dan? I do work with him. He works with international boss. Oh, yeah. So he shows email or stays. Community gardens. Yeah, would you still be there? Yeah, yeah, spend a lot of time. What? To fetch what? To fetch information on those. Yeah, great, great folks. Somebody comes and they're like, oh, John Jackson, they came after you were there. It's at 1220 Elmwood Street. And now he's at the end of the OPA. And now he's at the end of the school social policy practice. Oh, how about that? Interesting. They have an anthropologist instead of filming. I mean, if you have a card or something, I can take you out to take you out to. Oh, okay. So, yeah, so I didn't, that, is, is it our email address? Yeah, okay. All right. Well, I'll, I'll send you the instructions. I'll send you the instructions. It'll, it'll probably give you what you want. Can Dan use it too? If I get his email address. <laughs> nice. It's not about to talk about reparations. Nice. If I'm not around when this ends, it means I left it to pick up. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> My name is Kay, and I am a partner at a small uh, minority owned law firm called Ahmad Zafris, also a proud uh, member of the board of CLS and PLA. So I feel very privileged to be here today and to moderate uh, the third and last panel of the afternoon. So we've talked about the bad, we've talked about the good, and we're about to talk about the future. So when I was tasked with introducing our distinguished panelists, I, since we're talking about data, personal data, availability of it, I of course thought, okay, I'll ask Google. What, they, what it has to say about the panelists. So Jonathan Pyle uh, is the recipient of the 2015 Pennsylvania Legal Aid Network Excellence Award, well-deserved. Um, best part about it was that I found a YouTube video that is all about Jonathan. And so some of the things that I learned yeah. about Jonathan. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. Play. <laughs> it's a wonderful four and a half minute video for anybody who wants to look. <laughs> And uh, so Jonathan is uh, the contract performance officer at Philadelphia Legal Assistance. And there he makes sure that PLA complies with government regulations and contractual obligations. Um, and uh, he is the rare combination of a lawyer and a technological savant. That's what YouTube said. <laughs> so, <laughs> Um, and just a couple of things that he's done, uh, streamlined a legal research and supervision process for the foreclosure hotline. I'm sure he's going to be talking about more, more about that. Um, created a wiki for hotline, uh, for the, the uh, foreclosure hotline for paralegals to use. Uh, developed a couple of apps and we'll go into that more. But most importantly in my mind, uh, Jonathan is an awesome bass player, uh, and it was, it was helped uh, cram down win Law Rocks at uh, Union Transfer. I was there to witness it. <laughs> so uh, Maya Giacomox, um is, I found out that she um, was previously a deputy policy director at, where, at the city of Philadelphia, where she helped to implement the Sandy Hook principles, which is a code of conduct for the gun and ammunition industry. She was promoted to policy director. Um, that was effective January 1st of 2014. Um, and she was, act she was selected for the inaugural class um, of a nationally competitive process to the Results for America uh, the local Moneyball for Government Fellowship Program in September of 2014. And today, Maya is Vice President for Evidence-Based Policy uh, Implementation for Results for America. So you did very well in your, <laughs> <laughs> your fellowship program. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm waiting for you to accept my LinkedIn invitation. <laughs> <laughs> I will, I promise. Okay. Um, and Amy Hillier, 
Uh, she is associate professor at the University of Pennsylvania School of Design, and she teaches courses on GIS. I, I've got to say, I had to go and look, and it's geographic information systems. Is that right? Okay. Um, so that incorporates community de development and city planning. Um, urban studies, public health, and social work, all really great stuff. Um, I actually watched her TEDx uh, <laughs> Philly on YouTube again, great, great resource, where she was talking about mapping experience and access to opportunities in cities. I'm sure we'll hear more about that. Um, I, I also noted that on Rate My Professors, uh, there was one student who gave you a 4.5 overall rating. I think um, they, <laughs> Out of five. <laughs> so, excellent rating. <laughs> and um, I couldn't find you on LinkedIn or Facebook, but I found you on Vimeo. So, okay. <laughs> All right. So, those are the introductions. I'm going to give our panelists um, some individual time to talk to us, and then we'll take some questions afterwards. Jonathan? Okay. I was going to introduce myself by saying, hello, I'm Jonathan Pyle, and I know what an algorithm is. Uh, but anyway, so this panel is about the future of big data and how it impacts poverty. And I get to prognosticate, which is, which is good because I can, I, I can imagine an ideal perfect future world. Uh, so you can't hold me accountable for all the, the potential things that might go wrong because this is, this is a hypothetical world. I think that in the future, big data will allow advocates to gain actionable intelligence, and I'm using sort of business buzzwords deliberately, uh, on an everyday basis. R currently, the, the current state of affairs is we can do lots of great things with data, but it usually involves getting a special grant or having an intern for a whole summer to analyze things. Um, but I think it's going to become uh, something that we just do on a daily basis. We have an idea, we investigate it, we see what the result is. And I think that's going to be a game changer in the same way the invention of the spreadsheet was a game changer for businesses in the 1980s. Because before, in order to do analysis of data, you had to go to the, uh, like a data department in your company. And, th and then spreadsheets sort of gave the power to the, the decision makers directly to analyze data. And the people in the data, par data departments thought that was a terrible idea. They didn't know what they were doing, and they had no business running spreadsheets. Uh, but it did transform business, and I think it's going to transform the way that poverty, anti-poverty advocates work as well. And, I've, and I have sort of see some, some flavor of this in what I do. I'm sort of a tech nerd, but the, the tools are just becoming so much easier. Um, so like in the last few weeks, we, I've gotten questions like, what is the interaction of the foreclosure process with uh, seniors who have reverse mortgages? And so I was able to come up with that in a, in a matter of hours. Uh, somebody asked me, uh, what, how has gentrification in Philadelphia neighborhoods over the past few years uh, in, impacted eviction rates? And I was able to come up with the answer to that. Um, and uh, sometimes the answers to these questions aren't that interesting, but at least we didn't sink thousands of dollars into them and wait two years to get the result. Or is there a disparate impact in the way that uh, the, um, the revenue department is going after properties for re uh, reverse, uh, sorry, for, um, for delinquent real estate taxes? I was able to quickly come up with a map that sort of gave, gave, gave us an answer. And it, it's technology that has come up recently that's allowed that. And so I think that's going to be a game changer. In, in the future that we're, that we're just going to be able to do so much more, um, and, more and quickly. Uh, it's also going to allow, uh, as um, Mike Hollander was talking in the last panel, it's going to allow service providers to do what we do just much more efficiently and to serve more people uh, with the same amount of resources. Uh, so he was talking about our, our system for uh, getting documents from um, different sources. Uh, Tim Wisniewski has made available all these great open data sets. And so one of the ways we're using that is uh, when our advocates are talking to a client, our advocates press a button in our, our web-based database, and it goes out to six different databases, pulls down information, puts it all into nice PDFs or a summary, maybe it does some, some math on the data, and uh, gives you a, a summary um, that's like a, on a silver platter. And this is helpful in direct service because that would otherwise take a paralegal 20 minutes to do, and we can get the computer to do it uh, in just a f a f like one minute. Uh, so it, it allows us to just to serve more people, and, and that's, a, that's a big benefit. It's also going to allow anti-poverty work to be more effective, because we've been fighting poverty for really thousands of years with interventions that we're not really sure how effective they are, because it's, it's very hard to do double-blind testing 
uh, on uh, social service interventions. Uh, but the promise of big data is that there's just going to be so much data about everything that goes on that you don't have to do a double-blind study. You just look at the big mass of information, and there, because of random chance, there will be enough variation in the data that you'll be able to tell whether a service that was provided for at a certain point in time had an effect on that person. And I think this will, this will make anti-poverty work just so much more effective. It won't be based on the, uh, the nice intentions of a charity. It will be based on empirical evidence. And, uh, and some of these interventions that we're doing, you know, might work for some people, but not, but not work for others. And we should we should know that and and give people the right intervention for for their situation. I think it'll also allow service providers to switch from being reactive to being proactive. Uh, currently, the main way that we handle issues is we wait for somebody to come in the door to sort of self-diagnose a particular legal problem, and then we handle that legal problem. Uh, and then ho hopefully get a good outcome. But that, with big data, we can sort of approach that problem a different way. We can say, our client is the entire poverty population of Philadelphia. Let's look at what's going on in the aggregate to all these people. Let's identify the ones who are greatest at risk and intervene uh, with services for them, uh, rather than waiting for their perhaps erroneous self-diagnosis to come in the door. And it helps us to, to know whether maybe a, a case that came in the door isn't really a systemic problem, even though it might have seemed like it uh, when people came in. Uh, we can, it, this is sort of what's going on in healthcare right now. We don't, uh, the healthcare workers don't just expect uh, people who are at risk of stroke to constantly come into the office. They attach some device to them, and then they can intervene when there's uh, risk. And we do this somewhat at, at Philadelphia Legal Assistance. We monitor cases in foreclosure over time, and my computer in, in the morning automatically sends out these notifications saying, hey, it looks like this, uh, this client's case is heading south. Uh, and we email the housing counselor or the attorney involved or the paralegal and say, maybe you want to take, take a look at this to see uh, whether this is, uh, could be prevented. It, it also opens up the opportunity to practice law in a different way. Uh, rather than the traditional adversarial method of, of practicing law where you have a client and you go after somebody you don't like, uh, we, can, we can use big data to apply algorithms to see who's violating the law. And this, this, I've tried this in at least one circumstance in mortgage foreclosure where I have all the data about what's going on in, in, in court and I can apply an algorithm to see whether the local rules have been violated. And so one day I, I found these cases where there were violations, and I, I sent these emails to the attorneys for the mortgage companies, and I said, you know, hey, it looks like you violated the rule in this case, and, you know, you know, you know FYI, and I CC'd the court. And if, if you're a lawyer, this is a very unorthodox thing to that's, do. That's non-adversarial. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is a very unorthodox thing to do. You're like, usually you're supposed to have a client. Um, but I, you know, I thought I'd give it a shot. And I, I think I really annoyed the, the attorney for the mortgage company, and he was probably like, why are you emailing me? Like, how did you find out about this? Like, how did you sing me out? You're not saying that you represent this person. But it actually worked, and, you know, because sometimes it, things are just mistakes. Uh, but it also will, uh, the same monitoring will have an accountability effect. It will have a deterrent effect on actual bad, systemic bad behavior. Um, so, the, so that's sort of a summary of some of the things that I'm doing that I think are, are, are things that we'll do more of in the future. Um, but w one of the things I wanted to talk about was my prediction for the future of how um, big data will impact the poor. Um, and I, I think that, it, that it's not the, the George Orwell situation of, you know, there are going to be signs saying Big Brother is watching you. Uh, I think the signs will actually say that Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion are watching you. And so that, and some, that's not Big Brother in the sense that it's a government. Uh, it's more like Santa. Like, he, he knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. Um, uh, and this is, in some ways, good in some ways bad. Um, it's interesting to, to recall the, the word credit, and when we talk about credit reporting and FICO scores and, and credit uh, scores, uh, it used to mean in the Webster's 1913 dictionary uh, something broader than just something having to do with finance. Uh, it meant reputation derived from the confidence of others, esteem, honor, good name, estimation. And in the past, we used to signal this idea of credit with our, with our clothing. And so rich people wore nice clothing, and, and they had sumptuary laws to prevent poor people, people from wearing nice clothing and masquerading as, as uh, rich people. Uh, but uh, nowadays, it's, we have this freedom where you know, rich people can dress like complete schlubs, but they've got a credit card, and that's their credit. Uh, and it, it's a, in some ways, it's a, it's a freeing world. Um, 
Now, and, and I think that in the future, you know, these Equifax, Equifax, and TransUnion won't just be looking at the things they look at now. They'll be looking at some of the things that uh, companies are, are looking at that help with background checks and, and other things. They'll be collecting, I think the data that gets, that gets collected is going to have to be aggregated because that's what capitalism does. It makes things more efficient. It's going to be aggregated into these big data collectors, and I think the, the credit reporting people are sort of a natural place for that. And it won't just predict a FICO score. It will predict multidimensional measures of various things. The, their, their process really will be, let's use all this data about people, including, like, from the Internet of Things, how fast they were driving, like what did they set their thermostat to over the past five years. All this information is going to accumulate in, in, in these uh, aggregators because clients are, or because individuals are going to consent, you know, they're going to open up their, you know, their smartphone and they'll say, oh yeah, I consent to this, that, and the other thing because I want to use your service. And all this data is going to go up and be aggregated and then people can run predictive analytics on it uh, to try to say what is the likelihood that somebody meeting uh, somebody who has this history, um, what is the probability that their future behavior will be that? And so instead of just credit scores, we might have, you know, punctuality scores, reliability scores, um, trustworthiness scores. Uh, currently, people are, are using the credit, the credit reporting idea to, as, a, as a measure of morality. Um, uh, Charles Murray wrote this book, Falling Apart, where he wanted to track morality over time, over the decades, and what he used as a metric was bankruptcy filings. And so a lot of us in the room might be like really angry. Oh, I can't believe he's using bankruptcy filings as a measure of morality. Um, but I think the, the reality is that in the future, when you accumulate all of this big data together, um, you're going to be able to get something that's a shadow of, you know, whatever morality is. Uh, and it's not going to, the problem isn't going to be that it's inaccurate. The problem is going to be um, that it's kind of dangerous to have all that information in one place. Um, so the way that these predictive analytics work is, I'll give you an example. Uh, like, if you're trying to predict shark attacks, you know, you can use the metric of ice cream sales at ice cream trucks, and you will find that it correlates in space and time with shark attacks. And you might say, well, that's silly. Uh, it's, it, co you know, correlation is not causation. But with respect to these data models, it doesn't really matter. You just, you just keep piling on the different things that have correlations, and then pretty soon you've got a predictive model that is more accurate than somebody's, you know, best educated guess. And so th then that can be used for, for various things. Um, so uh, this is going to, this, this brave new world of, um, of experience knowing everything about you uh, is going to especially impact people in poverty because middle class people uh, can just basically slide through life and they'll, they'll have pretty good data. You know, they're always going to be t bringing in paychecks. Uh, but it's the poor who are going to be scrutinized. And people are going to be looking at the poor, trying to figure out, is this person the deserving poor or is this person the non-deserving poor? And, you know, we're, a lot of people aren't going to like that, that they're making that distinction. But, I mean, that's what they're uh, going to be doing. And I think in some ways this can be positive because we can get away from the world where employers get your rap sheet when they do your background check to a world where employers get some FICO score of, your, of the likelihood that you're going to be employable. Um, and, and so in some ways, some of this stuff will wash out. And one of the, the interesting things about doing data analysis when you just keep piling on the variables is that if you have just a few variables, and, and race and gender are among them, race and gender are predictors of things. Our zip code is a predictor of things. But if you put in more and more evidence, or more and more variables into your, into your um, model, then all of a sudden you notice that the zip code, the race, and the gender just wash out. They become unimportant. You take them out of your model, and you're left with a whole bunch of other things that actually do uh, predict the outcome. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't the disparate impact that we talked about before, uh, but the predictive model is not using race or using gender or zip code. Um, and so it's, it's important to realize that there are winners and losers of, of this type of system. Uh, it, this kind of system will be very good at identifying the math genius who lives in Section 8 housing in North Philadelphia. I mean, Goldman Sachs will probably extend her job offer when she's 17 years old because they'll see it pop up in the data. Uh, and so in some ways this is, this is good for people, but on the other hand it'll also be very efficient at, 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 at identifying the people who are most at risk of being not employable or not good risks. And it'll, and it'll be very good at denying opportunities to them. 
Uh, so if you're going to if you're going to limit the ability of these systems to use evidence, then what you're effectively doing is telling the, these companies that they need to average all poor people together and treat poor people as like a big uh, indiscriminate mass of people. And, uh, and that can be a downside for the, for the person in the low-income community who has kept their head down and, and works really hard. And you're sort of forcing the companies to not be able to distinguish between them and their neighbor who you know, deliberately didn't go to school and deliberately sold drugs. Uh, so in some ways, it's a denial of opportunity to some in an attempt to give opportunities to others. Um, it, it's sort of, as a, as a side note, there was a study that was done uh, of uh, how people use their money, and they, they pulled different parts of the country and different populations, and they found that South Asians living in New York City were different from populations throughout the United States in that they knew how credit scores worked, and they changed their behavior accordingly. And so they would do things like take, it, take out a credit card, uh, and use it to pay like one bill a month, and that actually does help your credit score. Um, but I, as, as I prognosticate, I think in the future, the, the models will be so sophisticated that there's no way to really game the system. The only way to you know, get the good scores is to, is to sort of be good or, or do a really, really good job of acting good, which might have the same effect. Um, so, I, so I think there are a lot of roles for anti-poverty advocates in, in the future. I think we, we need to protect the interest in, uh, in, a, in a blank slate. Like, at a certain point, uh, you shouldn't be held accountable for your actions in the past. Like, we need, to, we need to reinforce that that's the policy of statute of limitations, which were originally called statutes of repose. You know, the idea that, yes, you were bad in the past, but now you have repose. And I think we need to work culturally to, to reinforce the importance of that, as well as on a public policy matter. Um, but so that's all I have, since I'm out of time. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. Thank you. Thanks, Kay, for the introduction, and also to Community Legal Services and Philadelphia Legal Assistance for inviting me here. I want to build off of um, some of the things that you said. As, as Kay had mentioned, uh, for nearly eight years I worked in Philadelphia city government, most recently as the policy director in the mayor's office. And recently I joined Results for America, which is a nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C. And the mission of Results for America is to support government's use of data and rigorous evidence so that it's one of the primary factors in making policy and program decisions. So wonk of all wonk, right? Like, good prize for the, the, one of the wonkiest mission statements. But in all seriousness, the, the premise of the work is that Rather than flying blind and investing in programs and policies that might be working or that could be working, let's actually do the data analysis and, the, and, and a rigorous analysis so that we're investing in those programs and investing in those policies that have proven to be most effective in improving the well-being of people. So that the shortest path for government to meaningfully and in a lasting way improve the lives of residents is by investing in the most effective services that are available. Now, we don't always have data about what's the most effective program, and so in those cases, we need to be able to commit to collecting the data and analyzing the data, and then actually commit to making decisions based on that data. And if we do so, I believe that we're going to have much better public policy. And of course, data, therefore, is a very important and, in fact, one of the most crucial tools in creating really strong public policy, and this, this includes big data and open data. Um, I don't think that this implies in any way that because of the potential positive benefits of, public, of data on public policy that we should therefore weaken, um, it warrants weakening privacy protections, and in fact I think it's quite the opposite, that privacy protections really must be p maintained so that data can be used to maximize our well-being rather than to diminish it. But I'd like to talk about two examples, one at the federal level, one at the local level, that I think are doing a good job of trying to achieve the balance of maintaining data and privacy protections while at the same time trying to improve the efficiency of government services. So, and the first example comes out of our work uh, where we try to index what's happening in different federal departments and agencies to build capacity and data to be more evidence-based in the work. And it comes from the Administration for Children and Families at the federal level, which is a federal agency whose policy work is 
quite influential in many spaces, including um, Head Start, child welfare, TNF policies. And recently, in August of 2014, the Administration for Children and Families created what they call a confidentiality toolkit. Um, and with the mission of giving states and local governments clarity about the various rules governing confidentiality across their various departments. Uh, and the document was created actually in response to human service agencies who for decades have been trying to identify ways to use data, to share data, in order to promote collaboration, promote coordination across agencies, especially for clients who are touching multiple points in their system. Um, Programs often have these statutorily established confidentiality requirements, and it, that's a good thing. I mean, it protects the privacy and the dig dignity of the people who are seeking services. Um, but it also creates a lot of complexities um, resulting from these varying confidentiality rules. And, and that can be a serious impediment to state and local government and service providers to actually improve service coordination. Sometimes this happens because it's unclear whether it's a federal, state, or local regulation. Sometimes is it a requirement or just a longstanding practice? Um, are, are there exceptions? Can confidentiality be waived under what circumstances? And it's just a big black box. From a pr practitioner's perspective, you don't necessarily know. And so the confidentiality toolkit is, is one small way, but I think an important way to bring clarity to the requirements that are embedded in each of these programs. And also, importantly, it provides examples. So there's sample MOUs and sample data sharing agreements. And these are practical tools that are actually quite useful to practitioners who are trying to do the work. Um, I like this toolkit. I think it holds a lot of promise. And I'd like to think that in the future, all federal departments are doing things like this to bring more clarity to the state and local government, but also local service providers so that they can maintain the confidentiality and privacy protections that are required of, um, of the law and, and, and of the data, but at the same time trying to move towards a more efficient use of government services. Um, the other example comes from local government where the city of Seattle and Mayor Ed Murray is really serving as a local leader when it comes to privacy policy. Um, he announced in November of 2014 something called the Digital Privacy Initiative, which has many different pieces to it. Um, the first is to completely re-examine how the city of Seattle collects, uses, retains, and deletes data in order to maintain the privacy um, requirements of its residents. So the city started by convening stakeholders from 15 different departments, including service departments like fire, police, and the library, and also internal departments like IT and law. And together, these departments created a set of principles that govern how the city approaches privacy decisions. And these principles were then adopted by city council in 2015. Um, they also created what's called a privacy statement that communicates the city's privacy practices back to the public. And um, importantly, I think, also created an approach to then train city government staff about how to be compliant with the privacy principles. The mayor also created what he called a privacy advisory committee with folks from um, researchers, practitioners, community representatives who are advising the government's work on best practices and also informing them the possible impact of their solutions. And finally, he also proposed creating a chief privacy officer position who's meant to coordinate the, all of this work. And so I think all of this is really forward thinking, and kudos to Seattle for doing it. What's really great on top of it is that they're not doing it at the exclusion of thinking about data and open data and big data in particular. Seattle created their open data program in 2010 and since then have published over 400 different public data sets. Um, and they recently revised their open data policy. So now there's a provision that says it, data must be open by preference, which means that city departments will always make their data as accessible as possible, but only after screening for privacy and security and quality considerations. And it might be the case that other jurisdictions are doing this already just in practice, but I think it's really smart that they included it in their policy. 
So I think this is a great example of how government can be really proactive about protecting residents' data privacy concerns and rights um, while still being kind of forward thinking about open data and big data at the same time. And to me, these two examples give great insights about what the future can hold in this space. One is let's provide, let's, let's require of government that we provide clarity on how we can protect, protect privacy concerns but using it for the public good of creating more efficient government services. Government can be proactive about it, about how it collects and uses and retains and deletes data, and it needs to think about it, create a policy, communicate it back to the public, and also train its own employees on how to do so. Um, government can leverage the expertise of external stakeholders, so many people in the room who care deeply and know a lot about the issue, and can provide another voice back in. And we can continue to do the work of open data, big data, and other data-related initiatives while still maintaining the privacy concerns of individual residents. Um, I want to mention one other development at the federal level that I think is worth keeping an eye on for those who are interested, especially in what the federal government can be doing and is doing in this space of data privacy. President Obama recently signed into law the creation of a 15-member bipartisan commission, the Commission on Evidence-Based Policymaking, it's called. It was uh, sponsored by Representative Paul Ryan and Senator Patty Murray. And the purpose of this commission is to determine ways the federal government can organize, protect, and analyze data to improve public policy. And it has a strong focus on data privacy protections. The commission members will be named later this month, and then their final report with recommendations are due um, in August of next year, of 2017. So this could just be another federal commission, but it could be a really effective body for putting forth substantive policy recommendations. So I hope it is. I'm going to keep tracking it. Um, and to the extent that you're interested, I encourage you to do so, too. <laughs> Great, so uh, you looked up GIS, <laughs> Geographic Information Systems, and the great thing about GIS, or the great promise of GIS when I was a graduate student at Penn 20 years ago, um, was that it could help make sense of all the data. You know, as we're starting to swim in the data, you know, we need analytical tools to, to, to make sense of it. And I'll tell you, I've like, had plenty of students who've come saying, I'm, I'm here at Penn and I need a job when I get out of here. And, can you help me get skills that are useful and have currency? So someone actually told me that GIS does not stand for Geographic Information Systems. It stands for Guaranteed Income Security. <laughs> and as someone who's made a career now out of this, um, I think that there's, uh, there's some truth um, to that. Um, and I feel like I've been riding this wave of promise for a long time and become a little bit more cynical after, you know, time and sort of still waiting for that, that promise of what sort of Good, good data analysis will, will bring. Um, but let me just tell you two, two quick stories. One, 1998, 1999, cocktail party of some sort. Um, a friend from the mayor's office of information services like came over to me rather quietly and sort of slipped me uh, a floppy disk. <laughs> and it had, it had a shape file on it with the city's parcels, and that was not public. Like, this was a big deal. As a friend, she was giving me the, a, a, a digital file of the outline of the parcels of the city of Philadelphia, and that was a big deal, okay, 20 years ago. Now, of course, the cities have gotten over the fact that they're not going to reap tons of revenue from selling this, and they'll give it away. It's any city, any respectable city has its parcel layer online. I think, wow, like this is, it's a remarkable sort of how far we've come in the kinds of maps we can would make. And I'd say sort of if that was kind of a low point in, in sort of data access in my career, the high point came maybe in the fall where someone from the Department of Licenses Inspection emailed me and first of all said thank you for the work that you've been doing around documenting the location of billboards. We found it very helpful. We have taken it, we've cleaned it, we've refined it, and we're going to make it public, the location of the billboards. Now, for those of you who don't do any work around billboards, it might not sound re remarkable, but, but, but the, the, the location of billboards has been a well-held secret by the billboard industries for a long time. Um, and I'm thinking, someone from L and I wrote to me to say thank you, and we're going to make this data public. I was like, it is a new day. And it is not, I just checked as I came in, it's not an open data filler yet, but it will be. So I say, like, I feel like, like, I, I really believe in this, um, 
sort of this trajectory and this movement towards open data, I can't tell you the difference it's made in my teaching. And that's, you know, where I really see my biggest impact is teaching sort of the generation of, of analysts who, you know, may be working for or with you um, who, who have access to whole new amounts of data. Uh, and I don't want to take anything um, away from that. Um, I do, let's see if I can, if I can show you my, uh, um, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to get my slides up. Oh, here we go. Okay, give me a sec. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't want to distract you with my slides. Okay, this would be me. So I thought in looking forward, maybe we could look backwards for a minute because this is not the first period in time where we have been heralding the promise of empirical data and if only we had empirical data and use social science methods, like we can figure out the answers. Um, I mean, that's a little oversimplification of where we are and there really is a lot of promise, but, but this idea that, um, that, that we could collect data um, back, and this is Charles Booth's maps of London, that that, that 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 would lead to social change. That sort of if people knew what was going on and we knew, understood the patterns. And so actually, and this empirical investigation of poverty in London did change Charles Booth from being this sort of wealthy merchant to being much more of a sort of charitable guy in, in, in caring about poverty. Um, they, they collected tremendous amount of data um, you know, these sheets and door-to-door and -door survey work. I mean, there was no administrative data that you download from open data sites back then. Um, but still, this, this was sort of the part, a, a part of this social survey movement. Um, some of you may know the maps that they made at Chicago Hall House. Florence Kelly was in charge of this. She was actually hired by the federal government to do a, a, a bigger study and did some work um, and painstakingly collected data to try to show um, the conditions um, for working poor, um, different racial and ethnic um, patterns, um, but really as part of a um, trying to generate empathy, um, trying to show some of the conditions in which people um, are living and how um, problematic that was. Um, and I think that, to me, the real quintessential example of this, the sort of the promise of, of data and social sciences came with uh, W.E.B. Du Bois' book, The Philadelphia Negro, which I imagine, you know, many of you have read or parts of or all of. Um, and so Du Bois came to Philadelphia in 1896 at the invitation of the College Settlement Association and the University of Pennsylvania to study the Seventh Ward, which we're, we're just about in the Seventh Ward. So go down to Spruce Street and, you know, River to Seventh Street, um, Spruce to South, that's the Seventh Ward. Um, and he systematically, you know, he had to collect his data. Again, there was no way to sort of download the shape files from Open Data Philly, but he collected the data and mapped it. And he really believed at the beginning of study that, um, that he could do this, you know, and one, to, to bear witness to the conditions under which blacks were living. And he was really convinced that um, the problem had been framed by um, the white women who asked them to come, that, that blacks were somehow a problem, that the Philadelphia uh, Negro was a problem. And he wanted to reframe it that they were a, a people who faced problems, and that pro problem was primarily discrimination. And he thought by, you know, showing, documenting the empirical data, collecting the data and presenting it, that that would affect social change. And he had a spot, sort of this white capitalist who was going to get it and say, no. I can't believe it. Like I didn't, I didn't know. Like that, like, that's remarkable. Um, and as he said it out loud at conferences and started writing about it, he became less and less 